Hi learners, once again you are welcome to GCL Tutorials. This is a platform where we teach you social studies the simple way, where you also adopt several or strategies or methods that can help you in your studies in general. Okay, what are we building on? Talking about the various arms of government, I promise that I'll teach you or have a discussion on how they check one another and how this concept or principles work when it comes to our governance system. I would like to first of all thank, thank you for watching this lesson. And um, if you have not subscribed, you just I'd like you to do that in the first place. Just scroll down, touch the subscription button. There is a notification bell over there. If you want to be receiving videos or lessons, just click that bell and anytime a new lesson drops, you'll get access to it. Share with other friends out there, let them also learn and let's keep on enriching our knowledge. All right. What do we have today? I've already mentioned that it has to do with how the arms of government check themselves. All right. So let's refresh our minds. We understood in one of the lessons that the various arms of government, that is the three, the main three, um, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. These three arms of government have their principal rules or their main functions that they perform. As one is making the laws, another one is um, implementing them, and another one is interpreting the laws. So we have some formulating policies and so on and so forth. When these arms of government function, they are not supposed to interfere in another's business. So what happens is that the three are to operate independently. Now, scholars actually propose this concept to ensure that these three arms of government do not interfere in their affairs or their functions or the role they play as they execute them. When you take the executive arm of government, we have the president, the vice, and the cabinet ministers, the council of states there. As they are implementing the law, they are to ensure that they do that without any form of interference from the legislative arm of government or the judicial arm of government. Okay, now, how did this principle happen or occur? Several years ago, in the 18th century, we had scholars coming up with this and looking at the various arms of government, how they should function so that the administration will run smoothly. So um, this great man, French scholar known as Charles de Seconda, Baron de Montesquieu, came out with this uh, principle or concept. He propounded it. And he became popular. He is well known for that. And he's called the father of separation of powers. So he, the powers there representing the rules or the functions that the arms of government um, perform. Okay. So he said their duties. They should practice or they should perform their rules as if they are not depending on any other arm of government. So executive shouldn't depend on the uh, judiciary. The judiciary shouldn't depend on both the executive and the legislature. The legislature should also do the same. Then in terms of personnel, we should have people or personnel to work as legislators. We should have people to work as policy makers and implementers. And we should have people to work as justices, talking about the courts, that is the judiciary. So a lot of people bought into that idea, idea and then it became so popular. So he published this in one of his um, well-known books, L'Esprit de Loire. So he's a French scholar, so probably the first publications will come in French language, and later on they were translated into other languages. So as the book became popular and the concept became well-known, a lot of people had read about the concept, and they realized that, wow, this is a powerful concept. Let's adopt it, because we don't want these, the, we don't want clashes, okay, to occur. Uh, that is among the various arms of government. Before that, uh, other scholars have also mentioned it. In 1659, we had someone like James Harrington coming up with or mentioning this, but just that uh, it didn't become so popular by then. We had John Locke also coming in 1690, also mentioning this particular concept that has to do with 
how they should be separated in performing their powers. That is being independent in performing their powers and then also in terms of personnel. So this went on and on and then a lot of countries, especially the, the ones that were trying to adopt the democratic practice okay, or governance system, uh, bought into this idea. And so Montesquieu's ideas, as clearly stated in his book, L'Esprit de Loi, which means the spirit of laws, actually attracted a lot of, uh, or got a lot of attention. Um, people that started looking into it realized that as time went on, the practice was so helpful because if the arms of government are to perform their functions independently in terms of their powers and their, um, their personnel as well, it's going to help. Then they started noticing that, no, when that happens, some of the arms of government or some of the, uh, yeah, the various arms of government will feel, okay, they have to take the final decision. If I'm making the law, then I have to make the law. Whether it's a bad law or a good one, no one can criticize me. That means my actions or my, my responsibilities will not be subjected to any form of scrutiny or checks. And that is going to help. And it's going to bring some form of uh, uh, tyranny or abuse of power. When this was observed by Montesquieu, Montesquieu then added the checks and balances as a different concept. So separation of powers can't work smoothly without checks and balances. So I call them the twin concepts. So he merged that, the two concepts for them to have some level of checks. So if they can be able to check some of the things that the uh, um, other arms of government do, or if they are able to check themselves, then they can balance. So that is how come checks and balances also came. So it had to make the concept work properly, the concept of separation of powers work properly. How do the arms of government check one another? So let's look at the executive arm of government. When you pick the executive arm of government, you realize that they, they implement laws. They make um, uh, the policies or formulate policies. Of course, that is good. Now, if they have to do this, there are other functions like drawing the national budget. As they draw the budget, they will not just say, okay, finance minister, because uh, you are the finance minister, then carry out the project. You just take public funds and the money and then the project and then you go. No, the budget had to be what? Approved. So he goes to parliament, the legislature, to present the budget before them because they are controlling public expenditure or the public purse. So they will examine and they will debate on whatever has been stated in the budget and then know whether the monies are going to the right places or not or not, and whether the projects are needed or not. So in terms of that, it becomes a check. When a, a president elects a sworn into office, he has to prepare his government and come out with a, 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 the people that he wants to work with. A group of them is the cabinet ministers. He appoints or he nominates the cabinet ministers. So at that level, they are just nominated. The nominees will be subjected to vetting by the House of Parliament. So you see, the MPs or the legislators will form a vetting committee and they will check the nominees by asking them questions and trying to find out whether they are competent okay, for the job or the portfolio that they've been put to um, take charge or to handle or to... Uh, be the ones to execute the role or the functions over there. All right, so that becomes another check as well. So this is the legislature checking the executive arm of government. Okay, as they are also doing their check, they will also make their laws. Their laws are not going to be the final laws. Because the judiciary is a custodian of the constitution, any law over there, they have to what? Interpret. And the interpretation won't go down well with the people if the laws are bad laws. Therefore, as they examine, they will review the laws made by the legislature and tell whether they are good laws or not. 
because the characteristics of good laws, of course, they should be enforceable, they should be, be uh, publicized, they should stand the test of time, they should make sense, they should be in the interest of the people. So any law that is made and the judiciary examine or review those laws and they realize that those laws are not in the interest of the people, what is going to happen? They will declare them null and void or unconstitutional. This is what we call judicial review. Judicial review. So you get that point. So now judiciary is checking the legislature. This is what checks and balances brings. How uh, uh, will the judiciary also check them? He will be able to check the two of them in this way. If there is dispute among the two other arms of government, the judiciary can step in and then settle that dispute, okay? Because they are the main uh, body supposed to do that. All right. Now, let's see what is happening here. The executive, the head of the executive, who is the president, uh, can appoint judges, okay? Actually, people are calling for the review of this side. Can appoint judges, but cannot dismiss the judges, okay? When the judges engage in any form of misconduct, legislature will step in, form a committee, and they will investigate. If they find them guilty, they will impeach them. So legislature can impeach the justices in the courts and at the same time impeach the president as well, okay, when they engage in any form of misconduct or they do something that is against the provision of the constitution. Remember, all their rules and functions have been stated in the constitution. So you see how the checks go. You check me, I check you, and then that is how it happens. That's why when there are policies proposed by the executive arm of government and the president will have to even come to the house to present the state of the nation's address, those things that he's going to say in his address are going to be or debated on, okay? They will be subjected to intense scrutiny, okay, by the House of Parliament to so see how they are checking themselves, okay? So the prosecution will come. If any of them too is found guilty, the courts are there to prosecute uh, uh, the, the culprits or the officials in charge. Now, as this is going on, someone asked the question, so who watches the watchman? The watchman is watching. So one is one arm of government has become a watchman of the other. Who is checking all of them? The media. That's where the media comes in. So you hear about expressions like the fourth estate. The media is the fourth arm of government, the fourth estate. So this kind of realm is another realm where we have somebody who can sit and then zoom in, view, and look at the actions taken by these three arms of government. In the case of Ghana, where we even have ministers who are still MPs, so a minister as a legislator, if that happens, if a minister misconducts himself, how can the legislator um, check that person because it's the same person who comes here and plays a role as a lawmaker so it becomes complex but countries that enforce strict separation of powers actually especially the presidential system when you go to us will be able to do that but here in Ghana, because of lack of funds and it's a uh, strain in terms of financial provision okay so you can cater for them and be paying ministers separately and be paying mps too separately and that is going to um, um, have a tone on our public purse or coffers. Okay, so the media does its work. The media will scrutinize, check what they are doing, their actions, and bring them to the knowledge of the public. That's where we get to be aware that, oh, this is what is happening, the actions that they are taking. So media will make the three arms of government accountable. That is why if the media is going um, uh, towards a direction that we don't like, we have to talk. We have to also criticize them. So the public is, uh, itself is there watching. We are watching. We are seeing what the media is doing. That is why we don't expect them to be in bed with the ruling government to play party partisan politics, okay? Because that is going to affect us. Or if it happens that their sense of judgment will be clouded and their vision, they are the lens that they will use to look into what the government is doing or what the three arms of government are doing, we will not be able to 
um, uh, get that accountability that we want. So the media plays a role and the uh, three arms of government are also there playing that or their own role. But to prevent abuse of power and that dictatorial uh, practice coming from the, um, the individual arms of government, there should be checks and balances. So that is what Montesquieu um, introduced in his book, L'Esprit de Loi. And countries that are practicing the democratic principles are using them. And we are seeing some level of smooth administration, of course. So everyone must work. All the watchmen must work. Public, media, and the three arms of government must also function appropriately. And to see that um, we are able to have a smooth governance system. All right. So this is what I have for you on the separation, the concept of separation of powers, and then coupled with the checks and balances. I believe you have learned some things, and then some things you already know have also been made clearer. And um, if you have questions, put them in the comments box over there, and everything is going to be addressed. All right. So thank you for watching GCL Tutorials. We'll be here again with more interesting lessons. Don't stop studying and don't stop revising as well. I wish you all the best. See you again. Bye for now.